amazed. How many total students do you have uh, so each year? So CUNY is um, a system of 25 colleges. Uh, we serve about, the latest numbers are about 271,000 undergraduates and graduate students, and an additional about 220 Starts and ranges at um, literacy programs, which is kind of a very, very strong offering that we have in our um, system through um, through HD and graduate programs. We have everything from the geniuses that are named most recently to our alumni, um, who were named this past year through you know really award-winning um, faculty and, um, and programs. So we really truly run that full gamut with about half a million um, students. And we have everything from. Um, nationally ranked online programs through seven community colleges, um, through professional schools, and um, senior colleges. So yeah, we sort of have it all here. When we talk to folks outside of New York, they're always rather amazed and they feel that we're lucky that we have everything under the CUNY umbrella. I think at CUNY it can sometimes feel really large and overwhelming to manage a system of half a million students, but um, we're quite lucky. Great. Uh, I'd like to welcome Edgar Romney. Uh, Mr. Romney is Regional Director of Commercial Banking for Amalgamated Bank. And I think you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what yeah. you do. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Pleasure to, uh, to be here. So currently, I am the Regional Managing Director for the Northeast Region of Amalgamated Bank. Um, I think some of you are familiar with Amalgamated Bank, but it was founded here in, uh, in the city almost 90 years ago. Uh, by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, which is the Garment Workers, uh, really to give accessible banking services to union members and unions. And throughout the bank's history, it's worked on a variety of different projects, including large workforce housing and development uh, projects as well. Uh, currently, the bank is about a $5 billion bank, the largest B Corp bank uh, in the country. And I lead up a sales force, a sales force of commercial bankers that focus on nonprofit organizations, foundations, and we really focus on social, economic, and sustainability issues. So we do banking services, we do lending, and we have a pretty large investment management division that focuses on environmental and social governance type investing. Um, so I'm really pleasure to be here. Um, I'm originally from uh, Queens, but uh, currently live in Brooklyn and have three young kids who will all uh, wore their Halloween costumes out this morning, <laughs> 11, 8, and 3, and they, uh, my son is texting me now, asking what time I'm going to be home to take you. <laughs> so, uh, pleasure to be here. I hope to, to get to meet uh, all of you and potentially maybe even work with some of you as well. Very good. Welcome. Edgar, you want to uh, share with us, so some of us may not know what a B Corp is? Yes, yeah, so uh, a B Corp is uh, essentially a beneficial uh, um, corporation that's uh, dedicated to what we call the tri triple bottom line, so it's both profit people and as well as planet. Uh, so we look at more than just the profit of the organization, but how we are both in our, our mission and our activities, the way we run our business, um, how we're um, treating our employees, the type of wages that we pay, how we're treating the environment, what is our carbon footprint. Um, so all of those different things are board assess, on, assess us on a variety of different metrics, not just how profitable the institution is and how much we uh, bring it back to our shareholders, which is important, but there are other aspects, particularly around how we treat our employees, how we treat the community, and how we treat the environment. Uh, so we are, um, um, so there's probably, I would say, maybe 100 B Corps uh, in the country, and we're actually one of the largest uh, bank institutions to become a B Corp. Um, and we did that uh, about two years ago. We also launched uh, an IPO last year as well, in 2000, that summer of 2018. It was the largest, um, it was the first B Corp, um, excuse me, the first IPO launched by a union organization that was owned by a union. So which, we're not, majority, held by, uh, majority share is held by the union currently. But we're actually out in the public market now, so it's been pretty exciting for us. Uh, and we actually went out to the market with this mission of um, <coughs> mission-focused, mission-aligned financial institution that's trying to do more and do good for the world. So it's been pretty exciting. Great. And uh, finally, we have uh, Toby Shepherd Block, who leads Intermind, the social enterprise in the South Bronx. Yep. Uh, so uh, good morning. Uh, thrilled to be joining you. Uh, Intervine uh, is really focused on trying to harness the investment that's being made uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change as a generator of high road jobs for community members that have been historically marginalized. Um, and so we do everything from uh, landscaping at low income housing developments to uh, uh, doing planters for business improvement districts. Uh, we implement energy efficiency programs in multifamily buildings. 
um, and we do uh, stormwater management programs um, to responsibly manage rainfall um, and, uh, and keep pressure off the combined sewer system. We're really interested in these climate mitigation strategies that, um, that aren't sort of high tech and high capital, um, that generate a lot of jobs for some of the same people that are causing this problem in the first place, um, but jobs that are um, re reasonably entry level and middle scale, super accessible, um, and generate co-benefits, right? So some, some, some of these um, strategies we have for climate change mitigation, like building a dike across the harbor, um, don't do anything for us 364 days a year until there's an extreme weather event or another Sandy. Um, but rain gardens and bioswales, green roofs, uh, these generate all sorts of benefits year round um, and really create pathways for people to become, for people's work to really connect with um, improving their communities and the social experience of all their neighbors. Great, well welcome, welcome to all of you. Um, and uh, we are, have to say goodbye to a board member, John Ogilesby, um, who's been on the board, I gather, from my notes, since before we started recorded history. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on the board a long time. Um, uh, but, you know, my, I can date when I started, but apparently John goes back to uh, acronyms for the board that people don't even remember, except for those of us who are in the business. The Private Industry Council. Um, I don't know if many have heard of the Private Industry Council. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Joe McDermott here uh, in just a minute. But just uh, John's always been an uh, extremely thoughtful board member, fierce advocate for the less advantaged, uh, uh, always uh, uh, willing to offer a sober reminder of some of the daunting challenges that uh, we face here in New York in terms of uh, uh, enabling uh, the less advantaged to move up. So, we're very sorry that uh, you're going to be leaving us, um, but we're very happy, uh, of course, that Angie will be here representing CUNY. Um, it's a very important part of the whole workforce system. Uh, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Try to behave yourself. <laughs> it, was, it, was the, it was caught as last year. Joe, could you just introduce yourself, because we have a new folks. Oh, Joe McDermott, I'm president of CWE. Um, it was caught as last year, and I was with the Teamsters, and we got some money from Stu Eisenstadt, and I went over to Voorhees Tech, part of New York Tech, behind the Port Authority, and met a CEO by the name of John Mogulescu, and we've been together ever since, so it's an honor to say, Chris gave me two minutes, an honor to say things about you. Um, <laughs> but we have to put it in context, and Angie gave us the context that John was a HEO, a higher education officer, the bottom rank, and today he has an empire. Um, CUNY is our city's civilizing system. And since the 70s, with a mandate across the country that community colleges were responsible for worker education. Um, 270,000 people go to your continuing ed. Probably 200,000 are workers who are upskilled. John has been the mainstay. He didn't go the academic route, he went the worker education route, even though he's the dean of academic affairs. Um, he is severely underrated um, because he doesn't like notice. Uh, he's consistent and practical, but also tactile and personal. And he's clearly a player in a CUNY system where there are bodies over the decades everywhere. He rose and rose to the point that like maybe Dick Ravage or Richard Gottfried or Nadler, these people stay for decades and get better at it and achieve and achieve. He seems to be always achieving more and every program uh, does it better. So while he's resigning from this board, he's not retiring, thank God. But how come? 
when many of us kind of cease to exist after a while. The Nobelescu achieved this always achieving position. And it's, um, it's not like he's got passion, unless you're discussing the uh, adult work uh, failing reading scores. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't seem to have sharp elbows, but he's in the history of six different chances, and each time he gets a raise and a promotion. <laughs> And he would, his ego wouldn't allow him to say he has a, 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 an empire, but he does. And I was witness, particularly during the cabinet meetings or the sessions of, of, of uh, um, Ann Reynolds and Matt Goldstein. A new idea would come up and, and Berkman or Isiola or somebody, Hirschen, would say, give it to John, give it to John, give it to John. And so there were the HR contracts for upgrading our very needed uh, deep state for social <laughs> services. There was the college and prep on the college campuses program, give it to John. And the, um, the, the whole great problem still today, John hasn't solved it yet, uh, of, of retention in the community colleges. But take a look at the three or four programs he has attacking it, but particularly the model, the physical protector model of government. And he even gets Gates money, which is very hard to do. He's also the dean of the School of Professional Studies. Um, uh, there is a group called Murphy Institute that's now the School of Labor and Urban. And somebody says, well, Joe, how do you take Mr. Bud uh, uh, and School of Professional Studies continuing at Murphy? I said, well, John takes care of workers. John upgrades workers. John is into worker development. Murphy thinks about workers. And, and we need we need John more than we need Murphy in this day of, as I want to say, continuing burden of worker status. I'm talking too long, you don't get into me. <laughs> no, I'll cut these pages out. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped calling John with I have an idea because the answer was always, oh yeah, we're already doing that. <laughs> In fact, I'm reporting on it the next web board meeting, whatever we call ourselves. Um, workers go to school for wisdom and uh, self-satisfaction and skills and identity. And the City University continually had a school of professional studies responsible for those workers, identity, skills self-satisfaction and wisdom. <clears throat> as a body of collective wisdom, workers go there not as students, but as themselves, as workers learning to what else to do in their work. I don't call them students. Call them work. John knows that difference. And so I just want to say, John, uh, as the dean of everything at CUNY, <laughs> this board is going to miss you. Our records don't go beyond that. So this is a letter signed by Bill de Blasio. And we were also able to dig up your original appointment letter to at least the Workforce Investment Board, which was signed by one Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> and at the time, you probably thought that that would be worth something someday. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to get you a book. It's called The Beautiful Poetry of Donald Trump, but we decided that was probably not kosher for the meeting. Uh, but now that you're no longer on the board, uh, you're going to have a whole lot of time. I'm not going to give you the receipts, but we got you a book. We know that at once upon a time, you were a teacher in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Um, and this is called Brooklyn, the Once and Future City. I haven't read it, but I've heard it's a great read. And I'll have the board. I really want to thank you for your many years of service. Um, I guess I'll say a very quick word. Uh, you know, kind of emotional uh, after all these years on the board. And kind of, I don't want to 
know, look at this as my farewell tour, you know, but I am still at CUNY, but I do think about that end game as, as, as well. Um, you know, I'm so pleased that Angie did the uh, and I kind of pushed to get Angie to come to CUNY in a very rocky period, and she's been amazing, and, and uh, I've grown her portfolio in the new chancellor at Rosa, and, and uh, her future is here to be bright, and, she will be an you know, optimistic member of the board as opposed to me if I'm kind of cynical about, <laughs> about, about things. Uh, uh, Joe, who I've known for uh, so many years, I wish I had that on tape, like you said. Um, and, well, we, we do. We have it. Uh, Assuming everything true? worked out, we can. It'll great? be on YouTube in a couple of days. Isn't that great? So uh, I appreciate everything you said, Joe. And, and, uh, Joe has, has been a, a colleague and friend. And we battled at the same time over the years, but have great respect for each other. And, and that's important. And this and the other members of the board, uh, wish I got to get to know some of the newer members. Maybe I've had to cross in, in other ways. Um, you know, I've always, uh, in my career, tried to think about how we can shake up the institution to do things better. Um, and that's been what I've tried a little bit here on the board is, as well. You kind of, you know, you bask in your accomplishments, but you also think about what you haven't been able to do. And so there's, you know, so much work to do. To, to do. Um, and my only advice for new board members of this board is to try and figure out how to be active, how to push against kind of the status quo, um, how to understand that there are far too many people who are working in low wage jobs in the city, uh, that inequality is horrendous. I, I heard it on the radio the other day, two days ago, it wasn't surprising, 110,000 kids uh, uh, in a given year homeless in this, in this city and go to public school system. How is that possible? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, and what we can do, or what you can uh, do as a, as a board to, to say that is totally unacceptable. Uh, and, you know, not to preach to you, but uh, to, to try and think about how you all can be bold about what you do in your own work. Um, and even in your personal life, uh, I've had an amazing career. I've had a great experience on this board. I've gotten to know a lot of people over the years who are my friends who are no longer sit on this table. Uh, and, and colleagues, I thank you. It's been a privilege to, to serve on, on, on the board. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, I continue to probably tweet you about uh, you, Angie. To say, Angie, why didn't you say that? Why weren't you more aggressive? But, uh, um, you know, you still have lots of work ahead of you, and you should say that. So thank you for your gifts. I don't know what I'm going to do with the Julie Hanley. I really don't. Uh, I'm uh, sure Angie will keep it for you. Uh, <laughs> I think my children and grandchildren will get a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Um, well, uh, I mentioned this uh, right at the start, um, but uh, Louise Arroyo, our board chair, has decided that she uh, is going to step down as chair. She's going to continue on the board, and I believe will continue to be on the executive committee. Um, but her stepping down um, means we need to have uh, both an election for both the chair and the vice chair. Um, I'm currently vice chair. Continue to be vice chair. I'm willing to be vice chair. Um, it's just, I've hit a glass ceiling, it's as high as I can go since I'm not a business um, uh, member. Uh, but uh, we're opening um, the nomination process to anyone on the board. Uh, you must be nominated, but interestingly, you can nominate yourself. So uh, you can also nominate others. <laughs> So really, anyone who would like to serve as chair or as vice chair, um, you should uh, let Chris know um, by November 22nd at uh, very specific 5 p.m. <laughs> All right, so note that down. Um, and there's a description in the board book uh, for the role of chair and vice chair. And we are also opening um, or opening an invitation to people who would like to be on the executive committee. Um, there are Wes, Chauncey, anyone else on the executive committee here? Um, so there are uh, several of us who serve on the executive committee. That's four additional meetings a year. Uh, we get to have more in-depth conversations with um, DYCD and SBS about how things are going. That tends to be the bulk of the, of the meeting agenda. Uh, we do have an expectation that people attend uh, three out of the four meetings. And that really needs to be in person um, because if they're not there in person, we can't have folks um, things that we need to improve with the budget. So uh, if you're interested, again, uh, Please contact Chris by November 22nd, and uh, again, I assume that's 5 p.m. Yeah. Uh, we have a forum, so first I think I'll ask for us to consider the minutes, which are in your board book. Uh, they're at the beginning. Um, and I'll uh, ask if anybody has any comments or suggestions or changes they believe need to be made to the minutes. Not if we have a motion to approve. Motion. Second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And then, Chris, we also have a resolution. So if you look at, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at page 15, your board works. <coughs> so we have a resolution <coughs> to transfer some of the WIOA youth funding, and it's a, <clears throat> it's a pro proposal from the Department of Youth and Community Development, which manages the WIOA youth programs here in New York City. Um, and essentially what they want to do is they want to take some of the money that they have to spend on administrative costs, which is essentially overhead to support the programs, and shift it into the program side so they can spend more money on young people. So I don't know that this is terribly controversial, but I want to walk you through it. Um, so this is the current budget. This is, these are rounded figures. They have a little over $23 million in the current year, current budget year, uh, of WIOA youth dollars. And automatically, 10% goes towards administrative, and the, the, 90, the balance of the 90% of almost $21 million is in the program. They're proposing to move $730,000 from their admin into program. And so admin shrinks to, I think it's like 6 or 7%. Um, so that's essentially what they're proposing. They want to spend more money on young people, less money on administrative functions. Are there any questions about that? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's controversial, but... What was the year ago admin spending, if you know that offhand? Um, I don't, but it was not 10%. They also transferred last year. They, they moved some because they had funding from other sources, so they did move, uh, they reduced it from 10% to maybe a similar, maybe it's a little yeah. higher, 7 or 8%. So they were able to do that. 
haven't been able to do that in years past, but luckily there are other funding sources that enable this. Any other questions? Megan, you want to add anything? I don't have anything to add. We have a motion to approve the resolution to spend more money on you. <laughs> motion. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So, we're now going to turn it over to Megan. Um, Megan Keenan-Garden is Assistant Commissioner at the EYC, uh, New York State Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm going to use the acronym for sake of the new board members. Megan, what's going on? So, I have about four updates for the group. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, the first thing that I want to share is that for the last complete set of data that we have for fiscal year 2018, our youth programs, our WIOA funded youth <coughs> programs met or exceeded all of our negotiated goals with the state, so that's great news. Um, we don't have a credential attainment rate yet, a negotiated rate with the state, but 82% of our participants did achieve a credential. So that's really good news to share. Um, I also wanted to let you all know that tomorrow we're kicking off a brand new program for Opportunity Youth called Advance and Earn. The goal of that program is really to try to serve youth who have various disparate needs under one roof with one provider so that if they come in needing basic skills assistance and then they move on to needing HSC prep or high school equivalency prep and then they're ready to move on to an advanced training, they can do that with the same provider over multiple years instead of you know, doing one piece at one provider and maybe they might have the next thing that you need but they might not. So we're really trying to build a continuum under one roof for people who need a longer term uh, engagement. So we have six organizations that are starting that tomorrow. They're starting to, I mean, they're already obviously doing this, but think about recruitment and doing all that sort of thing, and program services actually begin in February. So we're very excited about that. Um, just so making that's new money that's going to that? Or <coughs> so that's money that is repurposed <coughs> from the Young Adult Internship Program and the Young Adult Literacy Program both of which DYCD was operating and the decision was made in partnership with NYC Opportunity to think about how we could use that money in a new way. Okay. Those how programs have been around for a while and, you know, how much time is to the budget? I think it's 13 or 14 million. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So That's a chunk of it's a chunk of change. We're very excited and looking forward to seeing how this approach um, works. So. Um, SYP, just to round out everybody's uh, knowledge about what happened this past summer, we served nearly 75,000 youth this past summer. We received over 151,000 applications for summer youth employment slots, and we paid out a record of $112 million in wages and stipends to participants. Um, Angie sort of alluded to this before, but we, our program represented the most significant changes to SYP programs in the program's 56 year history. There were many more program options in an effort to really meet, again, young people where they are and tailor their experiences based on their age. Um, if they're in college, if they're a high school student, if they need additional support, then just go to your job for six weeks. So that was really, um, what we rolled out this summer, um, and it went very well. And then last but not least, Work, Learn, and Grow is underway. That is a year-round initiative that was started three or four years ago to have young people who participated in this past summer's SYEP or the previous summer's SYEP continue to be engaged throughout the school year so they could continue to get a paid work experience in the after-school hours and work on their career awareness and exploration activities. So that is for young people who are in high school, they have to be in school, and they have to have participated in SYP the previous summer. But again, just an effort to just have that continuous engagement and skill building throughout the school year. And I think that program is slated to serve, yeah, 4,300 young people this year. Great. What I have for you. Thanks. Questions? Have we seen an uptick in employment participation in some of you? We had, you know, we have 
almost 14,000 work sites, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> when we, you know, add slots, we have to add them later, so uh, yes, it's definitely enough. And then there were 800 project-based learning sites also, so those were for younger youth who were engaged in a more project-based uh, experience, so yeah. Always welcoming of new employers, so. <coughs> what, if any, changes are you planning for next summer based on what you learned this summer? For SYEP? Yeah. You know, I th a lot of this was brand new this summer, so I think we will probably be in a place where we're making sure that any kinks that we experience this summer are ironed out, seeing where there were roadblocks or bottlenecks, where we can make those experiences and those things much smoother, and then see where we are. Do you do any sort of exit survey of yes. the participants? Yes. Do you know how it com satisfaction compared? Is it both the employer and the worker? I believe, yes, that everybody gets surveyed, and that is usually um, part of a, the SYP annual report, which should be coming out in the next month. It usually comes out November and December, <coughs> and that all of that data is included okay. in that report, which we will obviously share with the <coughs> report. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as many of the board members are aware, in the, at the end of the first quarter of the last fiscal year, we entered into a new contract period, which meant that there was a fair bit of flux in the system with some changes to which venues were managing which workforce one centers. So that's... Just tell people how long it's been since we've had a new <coughs> In several years, the old one. That, that's right. I, I wasn't in law, so I don't know off the top and of my head. <laughs> anyone? Six or eight years, anyway. <coughs> it was a while. Yeah, exactly. So it's a big deal. That's right. Um, and so we, the the vendors who are managing this, the system currently were previously managing it, but we had some changes to, to who was managing which centre. And there was also a lot of uncertainty in the first quarter with, with people being unsure about which centres they would, they would be managing. So all that's just really to say that we're very proud of the fact that we were still able to achieve 8% more hires last year compared to the, to the prior year. Um, part of that achievement, in addition to the job placements occurring through the Workforce One centres, um, we had 499 people who um, were given a wage increase that counted as a, as a promotion through our customised training program, which is a, a really significant outcome um, for that work. We had achieved a minimum, uh, sorry, an average wage of fifteen dollars and six prior to the minimum wage going into place on the first of January, and we ended the year with an average wage of fifteen dollars seventy three. The the second paragraph in the report, of apologies, I left out the word training. So these these um, numbers relate to, to training. We achieved a <coughs> wage, average wage of nineteen dollars twenty three, so up from fifteen dollars the prior year. We enrolled fewer people last year compared to the prior year for, for a number of reasons. Um, we discontinued the Home Health Aid training, which is a training program that uh, we, we had a, a really large volume of people going through that training. And that's just because the, the wages that people were getting as a result of those training trainings wasn't very high and we determined that it, it wasn't a high value um, training program for us to be investing effort into. We also had um, some flux in the in the tech training sector which resulted in fewer cohorts being delivered last year than what we had anticipated. Um, and in prior years, fewer of those customised training program grants had been awarded to businesses, which has a sort of slow flow and effect that meant that we had fewer people enrolled in training last year. We put in place a number of changes to the customised training program to tr really try and increase uptake. So where um, we had streamlined the application and reimbursement process to make it easier for employers to participate in that training program. 
um, we're doing marketing to raise awareness about the program and ensuring that we have quarterly board meetings to, to, to make sure that we're approving businesses on a regular basis. Um, it's just a couple of things that I'll highlight in terms of the, the training. I draw your attention to the, the tech training outcomes where we've got um, great wage outcomes for people who have been connected to jobs after they graduated from our trainings. And I also wanted to, to highlight um, a program that we do in <coughs> partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and the Writers Guild, which is partnering um, emerging writers that come from a diverse background with mentors who are very established in the field. So we have people from um, shows like House of Cards, Law and Order and Girls acting as mentors to young and emerging writers. It's a really exciting program. And that's it. Is there any questions? You, you mentioned, I think, approximately 400 people that got wage increases <coughs> that have been through a training program. Just so I'm clear, is that to say that having completed the training, they were automatically expecting a wage increase, or they have gone through training and subsequent to that experienced a wage increase? So that, that's a customized training program, and so businesses will apply to train their employees, and we... Um, we give them a, a grant to support that training, and it's a condition of the application and award that they commit to giving their employees a wage increase as, at the end of that training. And it's 499. Just shy of 500. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Curious, you mentioned there were fewer, uh, there was less traffic in the workforce centers, mm -hmm. yet you managed more placement, what do you attribute that success to? I, I think it's it's just doing, um, being more effective with the people who are coming through, through our centres, essentially. We, we did have fewer centres, so we closed three Workforce One centres last summer, one in Midtown, the South Shore of Staten Island, and Long Island City, so I think that that's part of the reason why we had less traffic, there were just fewer centres. Did you close those because you were seeing slower traffic than you were? Yeah, they, they just weren't priority areas to have Workforce One centres. In terms of Long Island City, we had opened up one of the industrial and transportation Workforce One centres nearby with the intention of closing down the Workforce One centre. The, we have a, a Workforce One centre on the North Shore of Staten Island that, that also serves the South Shore, and we have a, um, an Upper Manhattan Workforce One centre. Great. Anything else for Lucy? All right. Well, I um, believe Danelle Baird has joined us. Danelle, how are you? Well, thanks. Good morning. <laughs> Mr. Baird. Founder and CEO of Block Power, and I've been asking each of the new members to, to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Oh goodness! Uh, <laughs> like thirty seconds. Well, people took longer. Thirty seconds. How long you want? Thirty if you want. Okay. Uh, my name is Donnell Barrett. I'm glad to be with all of you this morning. Um, I uh, run a tech startup. We focus on uh, building software to do engineering analysis and financing and construction management for green building upgrades. We've completed um, over a thousand uh, green upgrades of buildings in New York City, uh, mostly churches, synagogues, uh, small businesses, multifamily buildings between four units um, to a hundred units. Uh, we work closely with Con Edison. We're going to be training a workforce to um, uh, remove 500 buildings in the Bronx, apartment buildings. We're going to move them from burning oil for heat and hot water to 100% renewable energy. So that project was announced by Con Edison yesterday. Um, and we have projects in Chicago and Philadelphia and uh, Oakland, California. Uh, we are deep in the weeds of learning about the new kind of workforce that we're going to need here in the city and here in the state to implement the green buildings laws and greenhouse gas reduction uh, laws that have been passed. And uh, prior to all this, I, I, I worked uh, for the National Labor Union Federation, Change to Win, 
uh, on the Earth Green Jobs Campaign, where we partnered with the Obama administration, particularly the U.S. Department of Energy, to try to take $90 billion of labor union pensions, which were supposed to buy green municipal bonds from different city governments. In exchange, the unions were supposed to get living wage jobs to actually do the green construction work. So from 2009 to 2012, I worked on that project across 20 states. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, a lot of the challenges were workforce, a lot of it was financial, a lot of it was um, engineering and technical stuff. So what we're trying to do is take the best of Wall Street, the best of workforce development, the best of Silicon Valley to come up with a new workforce for um, greening New York City. So that's what I do. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you. All right. So now my notes say to turn it over to Vice Chair Mark Elliott. Um, so I'm no longer Boris, I'm now Mark Elliott. <laughs> And um, I'm uh, going to update everybody on um, some work we did uh, surveying the uh, Workforce One centers um, around the issue of the gig economy and independent work. I would say in the last few years, there's been no topic that's uh, gotten more attention, certainly the executive committee, than this issue of the gig economy. Um, and I think I made the mistake at one of the executive committee meetings of saying, well, you know, we have 100,000 people coming through our one-stop center, why don't we just survey them and figure out how big a deal this is? And I was kind of a skeptic around all these claims that the gig economy is going to take over, everyone's going to be a gig worker. So Chris was like, okay, great, let's do that. Uh, and uh, my organization uh, volunteered to um, help design the survey and, uh, and um, field it. Uh, we uh, did this twice. Um, the first time was kind of a quick and dirty survey, and uh, I think we got a 62% or 68% so, response rate. But the results were really interesting, and so suddenly I was like, well, maybe we need to write something about this, but 68% wasn't a high enough response rate for the kind of work that we did. So we took our time and did the survey again. Um, we, it's actually a very interesting topic from a research standpoint. There's been a lot of different uh, studies uh, <coughs> of uh, the gig economy, and people use different kinds of definitions, but we spent a lot of time looking at what was available from the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the Pew um, Foundation, uh, who's been working on this, on the kinds of survey questions they've used, and developed hours, really, so we could compare our results to theirs, ultimately. Um, we did the surveys at each of the uh, uh, major borough Workforce One centers. Um, so we got all five boroughs. This was going <coughs> on, we should have mentioned the new contracts and all the, you know, the, I don't want to say chaos, but you know, there's a lot of change going on. And the, uh, the cooperation was fantastic. I mean, people were really, uh, really stepped up. They weren't getting compensated for this. Uh, but it got on conference calls. Chris and Reynolds went out and met with people and went over the survey with them. Um, and uh, they're really, uh, they're responsible for the sort of an astonishing 84% response rate we got, which uh, anybody who knows this kind of work is absolutely stellar. Uh, there were over 2,200 um, folks who uh, were eligible uh, customers of these five centers, and we got 1,882. So it's not only a high response rate, it's a large sample size. So we can really you know, do a lot with the data in terms of uh, analysis. Uh, we focused it on new customers, uh, or at least those who have not had any kind of service for six or more months. You can see there we did it for the first couple of weeks of June. Um, and I believe this is the first data on the prevalence of independent work that's really been done at any, under WIOA at any of the one-stop centers. I don't think anybody's really looked at this population. Um, and I think we'll go through it. I don't have the clicker, of course, so we can have a Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So uh, there's a lot of numbers here. These are characteristics, again, from those 1,800 or so. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of them. One that jumped out at me was the proportion of black or African Americans, 60 percent. That is more than double the proportion of New York City residents for black or African American. Who's in the, you're nodding your head. Is this consistent with your demographics? Um, white, 8 percent, far below. 
their representation in the city. 23% uh, um, were born outside of the U.S. I'm surprised at how few people have less than a high school diploma. 88% have a high school diploma or more. Um, and down at the bottom, you can see this is an important number to keep track of when we go through some of the findings. Uh, just over 70% had done any work for pay in the past 12 months. You know, it's interesting to me, there's 29% who are coming in who haven't done any work for pay in the last 12 months in the strongest economy we've had in most people's uh, memory. All right, so you've got it. All right, so here's um, oh, I should have really titled uh, something here for Joe McDermott. Joe has been more interested in this. Joe, I'm talking about you, kid. <laughs> I'm distracting Joe. Sorry, <laughs> Joe. This is really in your honor. I'm, you know, I was going to title this as the Joe McDermott. Well, thank you for this. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Here's uh, examples of independent work. Oh, let me mention, just this is part of the reason for my skepticism. I did a little work uh, yesterday looking at how different people had uh, defined the gig economy. There's a 2018 Bureau of Labor Statistics report, right? It's the federal government. They have all the data. They reported that the proportion of workers who were get, uh, working in, the, in independent work went down 10.1%, um, down from 10.7%. But they define this where uh, the independent work was their main source of income, right? We defined it as any source of income. Mm -hmm. Larry Katz and Alan Kruger have written probably the most highly regarded um, study on this using BLS definitions uh, from 2005 to 2015. They had done one study where they said gig work had actually gone down. They revised that and said it's gone from 10.7% to 15.8%. I'm just doing this for a little context for how these numbers um, have been bandied about. Well, then the Federal Reserve, another, so let me just finish this and then you can ask whatever the hard question is going to be. The uh, Federal Reserve and another reputable organization that most have heard of uh, did their own study on uh, the gig economy. And they came out with the finding 31% are making money from the gig economy. All these are big headlines, right? People don't go in and look at, well, what did, how did they actually define income, what did they include? The Federal Reserve included Airbnb, selling things on eBay, and um, uh, uh, using consignment shops. So uh, that was a much broader definition than anybody else, but the Federal Reserve number gets you know, tossed around as well. a third of the workers are in the, uh, in the gig economy. Chauncey. So I just, it was a clarification. Did Katz and Kruger, were they looking at sole source of income or any income? Any source but using, again, PLS. So, um, so here, we focused on independent work that you know, excluded things like Airbnb and eBay. It was you know, any kind of work, uh, in these, including these categories, and we gave people the examples, um, uh, uh, these examples, uh, to help them uh, decide whether uh, they fit or not. Among all customers, 21% reported that they had had some income from the independent work. But remember, 29% didn't work at all. When you look at th just those who worked in the past year, 32% had money, had earned money from doing independent work. So I was a skeptic going into this. To me, these are like stunningly high proportions of people who are really depending on independent work to make ends meet. Um, the types of independent work uh, in the past 12 months, these are among customers who said they had done any independent work. Um, uh, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can see the top one is caring for a child, elderly person, or disabled adult. I see how it feels here. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the survey was done, what's the period that it was done? First two weeks of June, basically. Okay. It's interesting this because year. I think with some of the changes around the CDPAP program, the Consumer Directive program, people who are potentially caring for someone who's disabled or elderly could now be eligible, potentially, to get paid for that work. Right, so this is in the prior 12 mm -hmm. months, so I'm guessing this doesn't include right. many of those. Mm -hmm. Right. But going so, forward, I mean, it could have an impact in that area specifically. Right, this is, again, you had to be compensated for doing this work. I know a lot of people 
care for children or elderly people don't get paid. Those are not included in this this definition. Or we try to make sure they weren't included in this definition. Um, what was that? It seemed like a different kind of, we weren't really focusing on what are people's sources of income, we wanted to understand them as workers, and to what extent were they, you know, doing jobs, what would be called jobs or employment that um, uh, we felt were relevant for the workforce model system. It, it, it might prove itself relevant, just anecdotally. One, because Airbnb was so lucrative for her that she essentially removed herself from the workforce to do that full time. And the other person, unbelievably, was making over $35,000 on eBay selling clothes. And so that other um, family lost their hand. Right, I'm not saying, I'm not disagreeing that it's not a relevant thing, but in terms of how, what our focus was, we made the decision we're going to go more with the Bureau of Labor Statistics data and not these other things, which most folks would think of as different kind of category, might be running your own business, but we wouldn't expect those folks to be coming into the ones about the workforce centers very much. But we could be wrong. I've been wrong on this whole thing, so what do I know? Um, just, just a comment on that. I think one of the things that um, resonates for me about that comment is it goes to the uh, sort of income and that people get from the jobs and how people make choices about it. So um, to some of the other factors that we look at in terms of what are the wages, what's the compensation um, for the jobs that people actually are doing, a lot of the jobs on the list were low-wage jobs. Um, and so sort of, you know, the other side of it is the <coughs> standards um, in terms of what people make and kind of benefits that people have. So it's, it's um, kind of relevant on that side. So uh, just a couple of things we pulled out in terms of the subgroups. You can see the proportion of workers reported doing independent work for pay by education level and by age. Uh, obviously one thing that really leaps out is the 43% of folks with less than a high school degree are, um, uh, have some compensation from independent work uh, in the past year. Uh, and surprise, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the, um, the younger folks are not the ones who are, who are coming into our Workforce One centers have lower levels of um, independent work than people 25 and up. Uh, there was a big focus in the survey on the use of mobile apps uh, or websites to connect customers to want to hire them. Um, and it was 9% among all customers, and 13% uh, had used them uh, uh, among those who had worked at all in the previous year. Yeah, all could be Uber, Lyft, I mean, there's so many of them. Mechanical Turk. Um, why did people use websites or mobile apps to find work? Well, there are reasons. Um, You know, we went into we, we did this in a way where we tried to you know do it in as an unbiased way as possible in terms of how we ask questions. We weren't trying to frame it as the gig economy is good or it's bad or whatever. And you know, I would think most of these are are pretty positive. Um, and I think it's a great way for folks to gain work experience. Obviously, being able to control their own schedule is huge. Uh, people even said it's fun. They can answer yes to more than one of these. So. Not like these are mutually exclusive. And Mark, this was specifically to using the websites, but yes. we saw that only nine percent, you know, of all of them use them. So, did you also ask just the question about what are the reasons why you're doing independent work? This was really around the websites and mobile apps. That, that was a large part of the interest of the, where this started. Uh, this again is of the folks on mobile apps or websites. Um, which, which best describes the income you earn? Uh, the largest group, 63%, said it's essential for meeting basic needs. Only 11% only said it's nice, but could live without it. Um, and here, this is really interesting to me. 
42% of the folks said they think of themselves as an employee of these services, right? Not as an independent contractor, independent worker. Did you ask how many hours they were working? Because I'm curious, there could be a correlation. No. Um, the, uh, you know, this was, you know, a very brief survey. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, could only, we could only ask so much on right. uh, what we did. I mean, obviously, this, I have a million questions I'd like to <laughs> ask. Uh, yep. You know, this. Did you look at the last slide by age? Yes. Yeah, we we'll picked out the things that look really, uh, you know, different. So we better, uh, we did do a slide on it. Typically, the different, there weren't really large differences uh, by that category. But again, this is hot off the press. We just analyzed this last week, um, and you know, there'll be more to come on this. Uh, here was a big question that um, the staff was really interested in. I think listen to this is really uh, big for you and um, whether you know under WIOA. Uh, we, the, group, the Workforce One Center operator don't get it, and we don't get any credit for people who are placed in a gig job, a 1099 job, right? The UL does not count that as a, but we have 36% um, of the folks coming in are interested in learning more about these websites and mobile apps to, uh, for earning extra money. So you think, well, most people really didn't think that, but how many customers are coming in? Was it 100,000? Mm -hmm. That's 36,000 people, mm -hmm. right? Fielding, helping people learn about how to use, you know, these apps and what to, even if they're complementing work that we might be placing them in. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, it would be huge demand. Um, here are the kinds of things they were interested in learning more about. Um, I'd be very uh, interested in the completing tests online. <coughs> being the top driving for a ride healing app at the bottom. <laughs> Here's more, I have some stuff about the survey question. <coughs> so that's it. Before I turn it back over to Larice, any questions, <laughs> comments? Mark, I have a question. So what, what or is the plan for using this data? I don't know. Okay. I just volunteered my organization to design the survey and analyze it. Now I think, um, I mean, one, I think it's really a question for SBS is, okay, well, how do we think about this? I would guess the folks, the one-stop operators, don't think about it that much. I'm not even sure if they ask about it that much. Um, you know, are they having to place, you know, do people want to keep doing these, this independent work? At, obviously, they're coming into us for assistance and getting a you know, a standard kind of job, do they want to keep doing their independent work to complement that income? And if so, how do we think about that in terms of the kind of jobs that get placed in and uh, how we make sure the schedules work? And if it's going to be a barrier, we need to know about it. We need to know about it up front. I think there's a big policy question um, about whether this kind of work should count uh, in terms of, you know, maybe actually could make more money doing this and that's not being captured um, right now in the data. There's a big research issue here where there's been work done on WIOA that shows that there's, John to this you may know about it, but they've shown big earnings gains for people coming into the one stops. And I've been a little skeptical because they've seemed so large. Well, there may be, uh, there may be a data issue that if you're not capturing the independent work in the pre prior income, then you may be overstating how much the income gain is for the people who <coughs> can do a job that counts under DOL standards. So, um, you know, I think uh, we don't have any money for it, but I think we want to write a brief just to get this out there. I sent, I happen to know Larry Katz, so I sent this presentation to him. I don't know if he, he hadn't responded as of this morning. I just sent it to him yesterday, so we're going to give him a lot of time. So I'll be curious what his reaction is and how important he thinks these findings are. He was Secretary of Labor as well as a Harvard economist. 
obviously regarded as sort of the authority on this stuff. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, no, I think we should write that. I think it's worth sharing. Mark, can you remind us the what, what do we know about the uh, wage, uh, what range of most customers? That's really a Lucinda question. We didn't ask on this. What are our rough sense of the wages of your average customer? Um, well, last year we finished with fifteen dollars seventy-three. So no, not, not what they get from what they earned before. What do we what do we know about the wages of a typical you know person who shows up at a restaurant? What are they making when they come in? Yeah, I, I would have to check. I don't I don't know. And you asking wages or earnings? Uh, both. I mean, they're just trying to get a sense of you know who who, who is the universe of people we're talking about. When we talk about who comes. In. Yeah, I would I would have to check on the on the wage increase, but from what I recall, we we have a you know a decent percentage increase in terms of the the prior wage and, and what they get to work with us. And just in Which terms is all, of just to clarify on that, that's all through the unemployment insurance system. Their prior earnings and placement earnings, or what's the data source when you say you have a thing? Self report. Self report. Um, and just in terms of the, the jobs that count question, um, we have quality standards in terms of the, the jobs that we work on, in terms of the guaranteed wages for <coughs> workers and the number of hours that they'll, that they'll get and, um, and whether or not they're getting benefits as, as well. So that's a, a critical difference. Right, right, but uh, I mean, overall, I, I think we're all interested in helping people earn more, right? Whether it's through a job with regular hours and regular wages, or complementing with a you know, work, or so anyway, it's just a significant could be a significant factor. A third of the people who are working are getting income from mm -hmm. that kind of work. It's not their only source, um, although the majority is most critical for them to make meet basic needs. But it's also interesting. <laughs> why are they are they hoping to continue that, or do they want to leave that? We have no idea whether it's something they want to, they're happy with or are they really unhappy and that's what they're looking for assistance. Mm -hmm. so. Just looking at the list, I mean, I think I mean, without the data, we don't know for a fact and there could be a range, but these typically are very low income, sometimes cash type, off the books uh, arrangements. They could be on the books, they could be, you know, but it's generally, you know, absent specific information, and you can kind of uh, draw, assume that it's low wage. Um, or no, I think that's right. Were there any surprises for you when you were playing with these numbers for a while? Well, I was surprised at the, how large a share of people reported doing independent work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. right. The third, mm -hmm. you know, get those kind of numbers, right? A third is double what cats and food are getting. Uh, so it's a much higher share than what this sort of gold standard is. The 9% they are using the apps. I'm sorry? The 9% they are using the apps. 13% of those who worked. So I think I'd, it's better. Well, if somebody didn't work, I don't really think it's clear that. Right, so I I, we put that up there because that's 9% of all customers. <coughs> so remember, only 71% worked. So of the 71% who worked, 13% of those use the websites or apps for finding the And um, do, these numbers are important, thank you. Do um, you have any sense that of the 13% they use them more than one once? They use test rapid more often? We might, we might. Because we gave them a whole list of different apps, um, I believe. In. So we might have some of that. <laughs> 13% seems low to me. Is that what you, your question? But 13% seems low. So 36% who want help. I'm not sure what we would tell them, right? If the majority of folks are getting it from something other than an objective website, not objective, but you know, a clearly an easily identifiable website, where are the 87% getting that information from? I think that that feels like a critical one if you, if the career centers were to more actively experiment with. 
What's the question? Um, sorry, so 13% app, so kind of, um, yeah. is it word of mouth or the other? Yeah, I mean, people have been doing independent work before the internet. Right. Right. So, <laughs> the, you know, you could do all, all of these kinds of tasks could be done other than online surveys. They all could have been done before without. So I think that's much more the experience of this group of people. Remember, we have a selected group. This is not of all workers. This is a group that's coming in the workforce one system. You know, they probably have less, fewer advantages than a lot of ones than other folks. So I wouldn't say this is representative of what you would expect of the New York City labor force. You'll notice uh, so. that the, um, those other jobs, Angie, you go see somebody with five dogs. Can I get a job working with dogs? Uh, my neighbor needs help. <coughs> she needs another home care attendant, and it's informal. What number there was that? Okay, average. 42% see themselves as employees. Yes. Of course, that's the big battle. Yes. In California at all. Um, employees of whom? Of Dance Rabbit or Mrs. Jones, who hired to take care of her elderly mother? or? That was of the, uh, well, I was putting this back up, this is the types of work they've done. So I think a lot of these things you can see here, you know, people have been doing a lot of these before there were the apps, right? So um, the informal economy, we didn't ask whether things were on the books or off the books, right? So <laughs> I think a lot of this could have been informal economy stuff where they got compensated for doing some of these things. So let's go into that chart. <coughs> Percentage are among customers that they earn money from jobs through the types of websites or mobile apps described. Right? So the 42%, this is again of people who, you know, that group who found and work through websites or mobile or these other apps. Um, think of the symbol that sells as an employee of that app or that website, whether it's a, a you know, cleaning service, Uber, Lyft. You know, not the receiver of the service, but the person who hired them. I believe of those services, yes, of the mobile web, of the websites or mobile apps. Okay. I'm, I'm, do we have a thought as to whether the recurring nature of the work might influence whether someone thinks of themselves as an employee or not? Mm. So if you're a chronic, if you're providing a chronic service, home health care, dog walking <laughs> services to the same client, let's say the same buyer, even if it's through an online app, then maybe you view yourself as an employer, but if you're kind of intermittent and you're working with multiple clients. I would think so. We didn't have we don't have any evidence from this, but I, I would I would agree with you that yes. Right? Uber drivers who drive full time are going to be more like a <coughs> employee than somebody who does right. you know, an occasional or, or an Uber driver who switches between Uber and Lyft constantly. Right. For, well then that's more complicated, right? Right, but, but that's two different employers.
As Mark said, this work has been going on, the so-called independent or gig work has been going on since the beginning of time. And I would be interested as to whether it's now more on the books, perhaps as 1099, as opposed to cash economy, because if you're working through Uber or what have you, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. Um, and I, I agree that ideally, you, well, not for somebody who is looking for full-time work with benefits, that that is the best solution. I also believe that there are many people uh, who may be willing to be more at risk. So the example of somebody who is working for Uber and for Lyft, there are people who do want to, I would say, be more entrepreneurial, be more of an independent contractor, and may in fact be able to make more money you know, so maybe you can make $25 an hour, $20 an hour with no benefits and work 40 or 50 hours a week. You don't get overtime, perhaps, but you may take home more than you would getting $15 an hour with benefits. And I think the idea of not counting that might be unwise. All right, well, um, let's go on another survey. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, drive my organization out of business before long. Um, well, thank you. Uh, and I'm uh, now going to move us to the last part of uh, the agenda, um, which is a discussion about high road employer practices. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris to do this. <clears throat> so there's a, on page 17 of the board books, there's a, a one pager on this that we sent out to the uh, board. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is a topic, the topic of high road employment, job quality. It's something that we've talked recently with the executive committee about. I've talked to a few additional members about this. Um, and, and I think this is a, a really promising new direction for the board to take on, to become champions of high road employer practices. Um, you know, this, this is becoming a real trend in the workforce development field, talking about improving job quality and uh, working with employers to adopt certain types of practices or strategies. You have organizations, it's national organizations like the National Fund for Workforce Solutions, the Aspen Institute, and many others that are talking about this, developing <coughs> tools, uh, publications, etc. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately there's a, a growing body of evidence that it works. In other words, that the, at least a number of high road <coughs> employer practices uh, can improve the quality of jobs for workers while also helping the bottom line and competitiveness of businesses. So this was a list that uh, several uh, sort of created between myself and uh, Larice, our, our chair. We wanted to give a number of things for the board to consider. We certainly don't have to be limited to this, um, but I want to walk you through them. Because what we're thinking about is choosing one to three and really focusing on them over, the, say, the next year. And both applying them within our own organizations, regardless of whether you're for profit, nonprofit, or public agency, um, to sort of look within and reflect and see what changes might be possible. And then to take a second phase and try to conduct outreach to for profit businesses across the city of New York. So let me go through the seven. So the first is hiring. So hiring full-time workers from what I would call, or what we would call the, the, the public talent pipeline. So people who've gone through um, public workforce development programs, um, public career and technical education high schools, recent CUNY grads. Um, number two would be preparing youth. 
you know, cultivating the, the pipeline of future workers by offering career exploration, work, internship opportunities to help prepare youth. And of course, this board, many of you know, for three years running, we had a large internship campaign. Uh, number three, upskilling current workers, so investing in the skill development with a really uh, of current workers with a strong emphasis on entry and mid-level workers. Advancement, creating clear pathways for advancement and particularly for entry-level workers. Um, ownership, this is something that uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, I think, spoke a little bit about when he addressed the board back in June, which is this idea of workers owning a chunk of, of what they're doing, and whether that's stock options or profit sharing, which isn't exactly ownership, but it's a, it's a way of bringing back some of the proceeds into the workers, worker cooperative structures, et cetera. Benefits, increasing paid time off for personal sick or parental leave beyond what's required by law. Uh, and decision making, giving workers more autonomy for making business decisions. So this was a list that we came up with. Um, and I think essentially what we like to do is talk about this and see if there are talk and debate about which of these seem like things that, it, again, we want to explore more, learn more about as a board, and then potentially try to spread the, the gospel across the city of New York to hire to uh, for profit employers. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark to uh, facilitate the debate. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll actually start. So we spoke about this at the executive committee, and one of the things that became apparent is that these these strategies, the ones that are up on the screen, they don't work for everybody, uh, depending on the size of the organization, your type of operation. So, so one of the goals is to try and, and find the ones that are most in common with the, the range of businesses that are out there. So that, that's one of our goals, plus the ones that we have in the consultant. I want to weigh in on the benefit side. Um, I don't want to leave it to politicians to um, determine <coughs> what's best for business without businesses weighing in. I think as a number of business people on this panel, I think we have, on average, a better understanding than elected officials do about the pros and cons. 
giving somebody a week of paid time off at 52 is 2%. Two if it's two weeks, it's four it's an equivalent of a 4% uh, pay increase. And I would say most of us uh, do have paid time off. And I would say in general, it's the highest paid workers who have the best benefits. And part of my interest in being, and I, I run a business, uh, it was a training business. I started it 20 years ago. And we've always offered paid time off. Um, and I think it's just the right thing to do. And I don't think we're saying about increasing and above and beyond. Well, there, right now there is zero paid time off other than sick days. There's no parental leave on the books or anything like that? I'm talking about like vacation. New York State. <coughs> and, and, so so New York State. and a chunk of New York City government has parental leave. Right. But there's no, yeah, there's no paid vacation. So then this begs a larger question, are we a policy making board? Yeah, so I, I and again, I'm relatively new here, but my excitement in getting involved was to be potentially a positive role model to show what is possible that businesses can do, make a profit, and also treat workers well. And I agree with that. Um, but my question to you is, when you have a tiny little company, infant company starting out, I, so I personally was in a position where I didn't take any pay. I was able to not take pay, and my attitude was I would rather personally sacrifice so our workers could have more. Um, I was in a position where I could afford to do that. Not everybody can afford to do that. But I would say bluntly that a 67% increase in the minimum wage over the last three years is a much bigger challenge for businesses than the equivalent of a 2% or 4% increase in pay based on giving people paid time off. I, I feel like I would rather, that's hard for me because I'm paying people who are not working during that time period. So I would rather give someone more money per hour. For when they're working. For when they're working because then there's a return for me. That is. In my first year in business, I didn't pay myself at all. I paid workers equivalent to what I should have been paid. And the only reason I was able to do that was because I had saved money and invested in the business. Right. But I can't continue that model. I mean, that's just not, yeah, I we, mean, we, I'm working we, for everybody but myself. We should hear from other people, but I don't know, given your contract model, if this would even apply to you. Well, it's interesting because that she represents, you know, the potential new model for a lot of what our employers could begin to look like. And which, you know, it, it's interesting feedback for us at work, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one in four of the hiring and advancement um, are particularly interesting to me. And I think I would just kind of share a bit of, of data on, on the hiring front. I can understand the public, um, the benefit to, to um, bundling together the public talent pipeline, <coughs> but you know, from our recent CUNY grad perspective, we know that about a third of our BA grads are going into retail, food service, low wage admin, low wage um, accommodation um, work. And I think that kind of in our city, we have just our, our CUNY grads tend to be, I think, really squeezed out of. Um, the talent market. So I think that there's a very concrete campaign. We convert 57,000, um, or graduate 57,000 folks every May and June. And I think unless there's a real intervention with businesses to just understand access to our talent pool, um, we will continue to see, and there's plenty of research from Georgetown Center for Worker and for uh, Education and Workforce, that uh, there's an equity issue here. Um, first gen, black and brown, grads will disproportionately end up with a college degree in low-wage work unless there's a real concerted intervention. And I think that from a pure equity perspective, I think the city has to take that on much more concretely without sort of saying you're picking between CTE and other workforce programs. But there is a huge
fundamental equity problem with our college graduates coming out of a $3 billion public investment in SUNY. On the advancement front, there's 850,000, and you see it in the data from the workforce funds, um, and the number is 850,000 New Yorkers who have some college, no degree, or credential. And so again, from a really trying to understand what advancement looks like, whether that's tuition assistance programs, whether that's things like customized training. Um, the customized training program is incredible, but it's always been a bit small, right? And so I think just fresh looks at um, the OGT program, you've um, opted to sort of sunset to kind of look at other ways. So I just think this idea of advancement continues to dog the system, and we need some new and different approaches to think about that work. So those sort of get my two modes, just to, to think, but equity underlies all of this, and we sort of can't, in my mind, keep doing what we're doing, because from an advancement perspective, um, folks that are leading and are um, in this category of some college or degree are disproportionately female, black, and brown. And so I, I, I throw the equity lens on a lot of this work in terms of how we might prioritize this. Uh, Dr. King said you have to have a, a, a lot of tough-mindedness and tender-heartedness in order to be effective. Um, as a small business owner or startup owner, I want to echo that. And I think the comments that Laura made, the tough-minded part of me as a business owner reacts to this list and just says, okay, well, what do I get? For, I mean, like, what do I as a what improves my business. And I think if you guys say that there's data on the rationale and there's all these publications that say, well, if you increase paid time off, your workers are going to be more loyal, they're going to share the mission of your company. So therefore, when they are working, they're going to be worth the increased minimum wage per hour because the productivity per worker per hour is going to go up if you offer this two weeks. That's data that allows the tough-minded business operator to understand how this is going to help my business. Without that, if we're just kind of going to employers with a, a rightfully pro-worker agenda that isn't backed by data that allows them to understand like at a deep visceral level how this is going to be better for their business, I think we'd be really challenged. Back to CUNY, I think, you know, Amy, you and I had a conversation last week about CUNY. The reason I, as a tech company CEO, look for CUNY graduates is because they're cheaper than everybody else and they're smarter than everybody else. Because they are so overlooked, I can <coughs> offer salaries that are below the ridiculous you know, tech salaries that I have to pay um, that are still higher than what many CUNY graduates make, right? And so, again, back to this idea of like, well, what's the tough-minded business reason to like do the right thing? And how can we as a workforce investment board make sure that all of whatever goals we select, that we have the data and the messaging to support uh, educating business owners as to why this is actually good for our businesses? Mark, Mark told me about an 11-year-old who might want to hire who is attacking the Florida election system. But, uh, but we, we had years ago, a started in Michigan, and I would love to see it because it was about in terms of yeah, so so I'm uh, in the real estate, affordable housing development, construction business. Um, but we, when I say we, I meant the board uh, had an initiative where we were, you know, you go to a business owner and you say, "Hi, the government's here to help." Everybody usually goes the other direction. Right? So we, you know, and especially when it comes to hiring uh, unknowns of unknown commodity, unknown anything. So we thought it would be a great idea to have a little show where we can take some, excuse me, success stories uh, of, you know, of, of DYCD's programs, of SBS's programs, and take them and their employers uh, and go around to different groups, go to chambers of commerce meetings, go to uh, trade association meetings, and, and show them who the people are that they might be hiring, and show the people who did hire them and so the, the, it takes some of the scare factor away. It, get, it becomes less unknown to them. They recognize the people, the employers. They may recognize something in them that they took a risk and it was worth it for them. They're hearing it from their mouth, not ours. Uh, they look at the person that's uh, that's brought along that was employed, and they say, well, you know, yeah, that looks like <coughs> one of my other employees, or that looks like my kids, or whoever. And, and, and then they become familiar with it. It's not such 
a daunting task. But trying to do it on paper is a little hard. And I, and I think, you know, it would be great if we could get that, that energy back and that program back of going around to these different groups. And we all, we all belong to trade associations of some sort or another. And we all have annual meetings or quarterly meetings. And, you know, with not too much effort, we could get on the agenda and, and do something. Because we did it once uh, at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. We had a, a woman who, who started out in an SYE program, ended up being uh, an assistant manager at uh, CBS. So CBS manager was there, and the person that got hired, and, and it, was, it, it was just a real success. It opened people's eyes. Yes, and to you. As a union representative, uh, we are happy to engage. Um, I first want to really endorse this idea. I um, think it's awesome that that we think about models of, and strategies around promoting high road employment, both at the individual kind of um, employer level, but also at the macro level. Uh, because at the macro level, we're in a consumer society. So if we have, if we're promoting high road policies, high road practices, training, good jobs, um, then that stimulates the economy. That creates more jobs. That creates uh, more success, stronger communities. So it's a positive road to be on. It's an upward spiral as opposed to kind of a race to the bottom. So the idea of thinking about what are all the ways that we need to weigh in and think about <coughs> what what is a, a high road, or what are high road approaches that work, um, is something that is great. And so, um, you know, adding a couple items to the list. Um, while this is workforce development and training, it's also about what are the what makes a good job at the end of that training, um, and not just so we're training people to end up in low wage, non benefited jobs that people have to supplement their income and have two, three jobs on the books, off the books, whatever it is, um, just to make ends meet. So one thing is to think about figuring out ways to promote um, as part of this mix employers who pay living wages or the established industry standard wages in some industries, like um, meaning that uh, I'm a representative of, we have established an industry standard wage and benefit, and that allows for fair competition for employers um, as they compete against each other in the world of the contractors and the subcontractors, if the labor costs are equal, um, then it, you know everybody competes based on their business model, but not who can pay the lowest wages or who can pay the lowest benefits. So that's that's a fair uh, system that allows for people to compete against each other. Uh, the same is true of, of a number of other unions that have established sort of an industry standard, um, and that there's a big difference between a living wage and a minimum wage, and we know both the city and the state have taken real steps to try to address that um, that issue, um, but that we're leaning on the side of what's a living wage as opposed to what's um, poor employers who pay the minimum wage, um, 
The second sort of relates to the, the worker's role in all of this and thinking about labor peace, the right to organize, um, and that adds a certain value. So if there's a simple, easy process, a federal labor law gives every worker the right to organize, and as we're kind of expanding the definition and taking on the issue of uh, workers and as the economy is changing, um, incentivizing those employers who uh, agree to a simple, easy, non-disruptive process as opposed to spending a lot of money fighting it and turning it into something contentious that could be disruptive, um, that's not really good for anybody. Um, and it doesn't really respect the worker's voice. It's great to think about uh, worker ownership, but workers may decide they'd rather form a union than um, form a workers' cooperative. And that should be given, um, you know, employers who who decide to respect the decision of their employees, um, that should be promoted and valued just like any other uh, way <coughs> the workers may want to exercise a voice in, um, in decision making. Right. Sorry, your name is I'm Lenore. 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 So I come from the 32 DJ. So, so, it, so it's good to follow you so I can reinforce the thing you just said. <laughs> so, uh, that's I, nice. I, that's right. That's right. So I, I like the idea of advocating for the, the living wage for the minimum wage. And I'll also echo what you said, which is that I, I love the idea of high road employer strategies as something that this board can be ambassadors for in the rules that we have. Uh, I, I don't fathom us as policy making, but I do believe we have the ability to be aspirational um, and illustrative of what good employment, good business practices can look like. Um, I, I agree with, with Donald that juxtaposed or combined with this should be a clear articulation of the business case. Because um, there are going to be those who will only respond to that business case. But I also think that there are uh, well-intentioned business people who, without knowing what other things they could or should be doing, once informed or their awareness being heightened, would say, well, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> I could perhaps incorporate that. You know, and so it's, it, there's, there's the argument of the, the business thing to do and the right thing to do. Some people only respond to the business thing to do. Some people respond to the right thing to do, but they don't know what the right thing to do is. Um, I'd you know, I have my opinions of which of these uh, would be great, but I'd love to know, so I think this has to be uh, authentic for us, so I would love to know, uh, even if it's an unscientific poll, of kind of how our respective organizations do or don't align with these seven or the ones that have been suggested, but even having done the analysis of where we all fit into this, uh, I wouldn't devolve to the least common denominator. I think we still have to be bold, and even if we don't have it, we can challenge ourselves, and therefore challenge the city to do more. I'm conscious of time. After 10:30, yeah. I'm going to ask maybe two more comments. <clears throat> sure. Um, well, as um, Marriott, being a uh, being a global company, we actually practice it from three to seven, and I think where we have an opportunity is number one and two. Um, last time we had Broadway Association meeting for hotels, uh, the Deputy Mayor Thompson did attend the meeting. And we expressed, especially I personally told him, look, we have 30 Marriott hotels in New York City. We are offering to offer some type of, uh, not internship, but especially uh, bringing the kids in one day, just teach them uh, what the hotel business is about, you know. And then we'll have some various uh, departmental speakers talk to them. I said, if you can even find a place, put the uh, students in the classroom or somewhere, we are willing to go and, and uh, talk to them as part of our social responsibility. But I think the impact will be if the city were to be able to bring the kids to the hotel and have a tour, uh, have some education. Because a lot of people seem to think hotel business is just about checking in and checking out. And I know Angie and uh, uh, Jennifer, they've been working very hard to see if they can get some of the existing hotel employees back into education so they can advance themselves. But it's, it's a little challenging, you know. But I think if we can get them in the high school levels, you know, educate them and show them. Because 
I personally, my job, I created my own job in the hotel business. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> today, I, I, I am the uh, director of uh, community relations for all the Marriott's in New York City. I created my own job. And all I'm doing is basically any hotel has issues, they call me and then I just troubleshoot. You know. And uh, besides that, the hotel business is becoming more of a real estate business. Because when you see Marriott hotels, Hilton hotels, uh, Hyatt hotels, they don't own the buildings. The buildings are owned by individuals, families, corporations, and whatnot. You know, the hotel is just managing for a fee. So there's so many components that the, uh, the students need to understand that, look, this is a real estate business. And I can guarantee you any ownership wants to hire someone who understands real estate versus just someone who takes care of the uh, customers or the guests. You know, so I think there's a big opportunity for uh, New York City hotels you know, to really help. You know, um, if you look at the management levels, anytime there's a hotel manager, manager uh, position available, we have to go outside New York State. You can't find anyone local. You know, so I think that would be a good start. Great. George, Megan, make sure you yeah, I, don't, I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more comment. Uh, so, I, um, I think I'm sorry. so one of the things we see a lot in the career center is that we, we do see customers, I would say, stop into a level because of the lack of uh, training. So uh, my, what caught my eye on it is the upskill of the current workers section of it. The way I'm seeing it, like, yes, um, one of the things you just said, like, what is it in it for the business? I think that one kind of like covers both ends. So you train your, your workers, and there is a bunch of, we have the CFAs, we have the apprenticeship program. So there's funds that will help the business train this, uh, their own employees or new employees nowadays. Uh, there's one also for, um, I have my cheat sheet for unemployed. So there's all kinds of like tax credits and things like that that can help businesses uh, train their current staff, the new staff, whatever. So, and when you have a strong work person under your umbrella, it opens up for more business. You can expand and now these employers uh, move up and opening the entry levels for the youth and the, uh, the CUNY students and everything else. And it's kind of like pushing to move the workers around moving them up to open the places for the other other people. And I think what we lack a lot in, in the state, and well, I'm sorry, in the city now, um, because of the board, uh, is communication. Like a lot of business don't know there's this, this uh, incentives and all that stuff around. So whatever we decide to go <coughs> with, communication is going to be key on both ends, what's fair and benefit for the worker, as well as what's in it for the business, for organizations to. <coughs> Well, I think <coughs> the, uh, this just should be thought of as the start of this conversation. We had this idea maybe close today, but I think people are raising things that we need to think about a little bit more. Um, and I know there are people who want to get uh, make suggestions and comments as well that didn't get a chance. So first I'm going to suggest we resume this conversation at our December uh, board meeting. Maybe we can do an interview online polling people so that we can come together we can discuss the results. You didn't follow me? Don't pick it and do something similar and I, I concur. <laughs>